Hi everyone. Um, we're going to start the panel about uh, public policies and uh, sharing economy. So just as uh, Doc Searles mentioned, uh, sharing is very disruptive. So the sharing economy is disruptive. As, uh, and, it's, and it's growing fast. The sharing economy is growing fast. So just, just as every booming uh, industry, uh, the sharing economy is, uh, is challenging um, traditional industries and it uh, provides several opportunities and, uh, and challenges in many fields, including the field of uh, public policy. So we're going to discuss that. And just to give you um, an example of what's happening now, um, Lyft and Sidecar are two real-time ride-sharing apps um, that have been very, very successful in the last months in San Francisco. And they've been, let's say, uh, discussing with the city of San Francisco to, to see if uh, this, this ride-sharing, real-time ride-sharing app was legal or illegal. Um, this is, so this is what's uh, happening now in the field of, of the sharing economy. So we were, we're going to discuss what, what are the, the, the opportunities um, in, the, in the field of public policies for, for the sharing economy. And for that, we have uh, four amazing ladies. And I will let them introduce themselves, maybe starting with uh, Anne-Laure. Thank you, Antonin. Hello everybody, I'm Anne-Laure, I'm a mediator, lawyer and the founder of uh, Sharelex. Uh, good morning everyone, uh, my name is Helen Goulden, I work at Nesta, we're a UK independent charity uh, and we finance innovations. Good morning, Molly Turner, I'm the director of public policy at Airbnb in from San Francisco. Good morning, um, with apologies for having lost my voice last night. Uh, April Rini, I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Collaborative Lab and um, focus quite a bit on policy also based in San Francisco. And April uh, lost her voice yesterday because we had a public policy jam with uh, 70 people including uh, most of the speakers. So for uh, two hours we discussed what are the, the, the opportunities in the field of uh, policy, public policies. And maybe April, you could start just mentioning what we discussed yesterday and some of the out outcomes, maybe. Sure. Um, it was a tremendous gathering, as Antonin mentioned, with just a big, a big round of thanks to everyone in this room who was there last night. Uh, an enormous amount of expertise, uh, geographic diversity, perspective diversity. Uh, so very rich conversations and. We began the evening with a panel presentation by um, several different people with, again, different perspectives, including uh, actually all three of these ladies, uh, along with Daniel Kaplan, who focused on digital democracy, and Javi Creus, who focused on his work with local governments in Spain and the difference between openness and collaboration. Um, and, then, uh, and then Lauren Anderson, also from Collaborative Lab, who gave a global perspective on some of the policy issues. And then we broke up into small group discussions focused on themes, um, really looking at what is the role both at a macro and a micro level for policy. And the themes that we looked at included such ideas as seeing the government itself as a sharing-based platform. So what does it mean for the government to actually imagine putting some of its assets into shared use? You could imagine something, for example, like a government uh, or city government car sharing scheme in which they use their own fleet of vehicles, which most cities have, and open those up to employee use on a shared basis, and perhaps even to resident use. What other kinds of ideas might we come up for with the, what, what other kinds of ideas might we come up for for the government um, um, for resilience planning? And when you think about resilience strategy, you can think about what it means to respond to natural disasters like Hurricane Sandy, or an earthquake in San Francisco, where I live, or um, any one of a variety of emergencies that could affect a city. How can we help cities and policymakers reimagine the potential for the sharing economy to respond to um, emergencies, but also more broadly to be proactive about planning for 
the future and their own resilience strategy. So that could include if a disaster were to strike, certain people could share their homes, um, other people could put their cars into shared use, other people could open up their Wi-Fi. Thinking about these very low-hanging fruit opportunities to start reimagining again the sharing economy um, today and then thinking about what it could become in the future. We also talked about um, what could some model policies be and best practices and guidelines for policymakers around the world. Uh, we brainstormed around what public-private partnerships could look like. So when the government, a government could partner with um, private companies and private sector interests to promote the sharing economy. And one example was brought up where Airbnb is partnering um, with Rio, looking at the World Cup and um, the Olympics. And the fact that in that case, partnering like that really can help distribute the wealth, the benefit that will come from a partnership like that means that not only it's not just the wealthy or hotels that are going to benefit from having lots of tourists visit Brazil, but really the entire community, anyone who touches the Airbnb community will benefit. And that includes people in neighborhoods and people at all levels of the economic pyramid. Um, and then last but not least, we talked about, again, digital platforms and the need for open data and how governments themselves need to be more inclusive of open data and sharing of data within their own platforms and systems and within the community. And really at the end of the day, what do all of these activities and efforts mean for redefining public services, reimagining public innovation, and reimagining civic engagement? Thank you. So we, we had like great discussions and, and, and great outcomes uh, from, from this public policy jam and we're going to follow up in, uh, with an article on wishare.net uh, written probably by uh, Collaborative Lab. And uh, we will also follow up with a group, an online group. So if some of you who didn't attend yesterday but who would like to be part of this group, just let, let us know at the end of the, of the, of the panel. Uh, you, men you mentioned cities, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and I, I remember Seoul, so Seoul in, in Seoul, Seoul, <laughs> in Korea, South Korea. Uh, so the mayor of uh, Seoul uh, announced that he wants his city to, be, to become a sharing city. Uh, could some of you, who, who knows more about that? Maybe Molly, you know more? No. Actually, good timing. One of our founders, Nate, is having dinner with him today <laughs> in Seoul. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the city of Seoul is one of the biggest cities in the world and also one of the most progressive in terms of policy. They're facing a lot of really interesting challenges that come from huge population growth, um, urbanization, and all of the wonderful benefits and costs that come with that. And the mayor of Seoul has recognized, thanks in part to a lot of the work that Lauren and Rachel and April have done through Collaborative Lab, with them that the sharing economy presents a really great solution to some of their greatest challenges. And so they've designated Seoul as a shareable city and are working through various ways they can support the sharing economy, both through policy, but also um, in encouraging more entrepreneurs to begin sharing models within the city. So, so why a city might see the sharing economy as an opportunity or why a city might see the sharing economy as a challenge? Will you talk more about challenges or opportunities? Maybe you can answer as well. Yeah, that's targeted at me. We will, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, a lot of you are probably interested in this panel because you read articles that say things like Antonin just said, which is um, sidecar and Lyft are illegal in San Francisco, which is not true, by the way. Um, and uh, it's not as black and white as that. Um, as we discussed last night, um, there's a gray area where laws don't necessarily say you can do this, but they also don't necessarily say you can't. And um, I think that presents an incredible opportunity to work with policymakers um, to better understand what is going on and how to best regulate it. And when I say regulate it, I mean there are really great reasons for regulation to protect public safety and other... Um, uh, other effects that various business models may have that are unintentional um, to protect against quote-unquote bad actors taking advantage of perfectly good systems. 
Um, so there's a great place for regulation, but um, I would caution all of you to not think of policymakers and regulators as the opponents, but rather as partners. And as Anton also mentioned, you know, Airbnb is working with cities like Rio to try and figure out problems, to, uh, solutions to their problems. For example, how do you host millions of people that are coming to the city of Rio over the next couple of years for the World Cup and the Olympics? And they see Airbnb as a great solution. So I think there are more opportunities than problems. And, and Laura, do you agree with this vision? Uh, yes, I do, but I would like to add something that uh, to, to, to make sure that it's an opportunity or a challenge for a city uh, to develop uh, sharing. I think the best thing is to ask citizens and to ask policy makers and to work with them uh, in order to see what exactly are the challenges and what are the opportunities. And the second thing is that we expect a lot of things from law and regulations, but uh, we don't necessarily need a law to authorize things. So uh, this gray area is also an opportunity for uh, agreements, free agreements, and it's also uh, an opportunity for new um, uh, jurisprudence, I mean, new position from judges. It means that uh, in France, for example, we have very good surprises in uh, many, in some areas with uh, the position of the judges. We have some good news for car sharing, for example, where it's been clearly stated by the, the last degree of our jurisdiction that sharing uh, is legal. Uh, it's not competing with uh, public uh, transport companies, official transport companies, so it's interesting. The question comes from the, the economic model, for example, when, it, when you, you pay for the service, then you compete uh, with the existing models, and then... Uh, you, you mean ride-sharing or, or carpooling, in this case, that the, rec the recent... Uh, yeah, car-sharing. Yeah. Car -sharing. Yeah, no, it's, it's ride-sharing, no? Covoiturage. Yes, it's covoiturage. Oh, yeah. Right, right, sharing, right, right sharing. Yeah, yeah. Because recently there was a, a, a status from a, a judge saying that uh, the last degree of, ju the of last jurisdiction, degree, yeah. no? the highest. Uh, that right sharing when you don't make money from your from your ride is okay. is legal is okay. Yeah. And um, wh what is your advice to uh, entrepreneurs when when they face uh, legal challenges? Your advice is that that uh, uh, the, the fact that they're in a gray area is not a bad thing. That, that's the first thing. Yes, the gray the gray area is not necessarily a bad thing, and um, the advice would be first make sure that you have understood all the existing legal context because before saying something is illegal, make sure it is really illegal, which is not always the case, and make the difference between illegal. N nothing, <laughs> gray area, and legitimate, which is not exactly the same uh, problem. So that, that's the, the position where we need to be quite clear. The second thing is the mediation approach. Work with policymakers, but also work with business you are disrupting, because the, 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 the danger, of course, comes from, from those existing and great business which have fears from uh, new uh, commerce. And the last thing is maybe be confident with uh, your ability to contract, to be clear of, where, of what you want and what you want to do, and be confident with the position of judges because judges are not uh, there to uh, prison, prevent uh, sharing to, to occur. I mean, we see very pragmatic decisions uh, in this field. So maybe yesterday we discussed about uh, uh, an idea which I found quite interesting is why not uh, taking policy makers and judges uh, through um, travel into the collaborative economy to show them, I mean, they are human beings uh, before being judges or policy makers, to show them and let them feel uh, the real interest of uh, sharing. Can you hear me? Yeah, much better. Um, so yeah, you mentioned uh, the opportunity to involve 
uh, policy makers or to be involved in the policy making process. Uh, wh what kind of advice could you give to uh, entrepreneurs who would like to be involved in the policy making process or, or what kind of stories maybe you might have in, you know, in this? Yeah, Helen? Um, yeah, so I, should, I think it's important to say that it's not just sort of the sharing economy and collaborative consumption that's in a period of disruption. So government is disrupting itself quite a lot and it's in a state of crisis in many countries in Europe. Um, we have problems of an aging population, we have sustainability problems, we have increasingly kind of social challenges and that's without sort of severe cuts to public sector funding and statutory services for many of our most vulnerable people. So governments themselves, certainly from a public service delivery perspective, are having to really think very radically about how they deliver services, how they meet the needs. And in many cases are recognizing that for years and years, services have been run that are actually quite fundamentally broken. And um, they're looking increasingly to non-state resources to think about that, how they can generate more people-powered responses to tackle the challenges, to uh, cope with public sector fu fun funding cuts, but also because there's an emerging belief that that might be better. So if you think about um, sort of how skill sharing platforms, so platforms uh, specifically that might find it difficult to find an obvious business model could find an increasingly good partnership with public sector. So if you have a skill sharing platform that can somehow kind of track evidence towards employability or support older people to share skills and services together. If you think about the many, many redistribution platforms, the community asset sharing platforms that can could map very sensibly to a, um, a public sector waste and recycling service. If you think about kind of um, carpooling and car sharing and how that could really reinvigorate and plug the gap in many rural community transport initiatives that have been cut. You know, there's enormous, there's never been, and I think I sort of perhaps rendered on about this last night to somebody over dinner, there's never been a better time to be um, approaching government with these sorts of services because they make much more sense. And I think at a time of crisis, the government is much more open to taking risks and experimenting and how, how would you start that so you, you you would launch a platform and then when your platform is successful when you when there is a, a growing uh, use you just talk to governments and you say you see I have a platform that is providing public good social good I think that's well you can start from the push end of it um, I would probably argue that there's probably a proliferation of platforms that probably need to evidence their impact a little bit more if they want to engage a public sector audience or uh, commissioners. But my sort of, um, where as an independent charity, where I would place our efforts would be thinking much more about the pool side. So how can we frame a conversation with commissioners of public services or commissioners and policymakers to kind of bring people together into the same room? I don't necessarily think it's... Um, uh, there's enough on the push of innovation side. I think it's more pulling and trying to bring a kind of innovation and commissioning processes actually that's probably necessary. What, what, what kind of impacts should you um, show to policymakers and what kind of impacts are they interested in? What are the impacts you, you might want to... Like uh, there was a, a study in San Francisco on the economic impact uh, Airbnb is having on the city of San Francisco. So this is the... The, the, the kinds of data you want to show to city officials, for example? It depends on what you're asking those uh, city officials to do. In Airbnb's case, um, you know, tourism is one of the biggest drivers of many city economies, including Paris. And um, the impact of Airbnb on a city's economy is really huge. And so um, the economic impacts have, have been very, very useful for us to demonstrate to policymakers that care about economic impacts. But policymakers that care about environmental impacts are not going to care as much about the economic impacts. So it depends who you're talking with. And building on that, um, I would actually fold back to the case of Seoul, South Korea, where they passed uh, legislation on December 31st of last year where they basically declared themselves to be a shareable city or a sharing city. And they spelled out their strategy for the different um, buckets or categories or themes where they think the sharing economy can really benefit them. As Molly mentioned, one is local economic development. Another is jobs and livelihood creation. 
Another is environmental sustainability and more efficient use of natural and um, you know, environmental resources to make things. Another had to do with culture, and there we can think more broadly around lifestyle choices. So if you want to sell yourself as a, a shareable city and you want to attract a certain kind of talent, a certain kind of lifestyle, a certain kind of view of the world, that's not necessarily an economic return, but that's a really important type of data, type of metric that you might want to be measuring. So I think, you know, your point about what kind of data do we need, figure out and, you know, to work in collaboration with policymakers to figure out what are the key drivers that you would like to prioritize. And what you find is that for many cities, it, the mix is different. A mega city in the developing world is going to have a different set of priorities than a small town in Midwestern United States. Not better or worse, they're just different. But when you can identify what the key drivers and needs and gaps are within a city, then you can back up and say, okay, what kind of data and how do we wanna harness this and what kinds of things? Also going back to the themes we talked about last night, you might focus on one or two different kinds of uh, promotional activities or sectors to focus on first, instead of saying, we're just gonna do this all at once. Start methodically and, and work where there's the lowest hanging fruit um, and the greatest traction today, and then use that as a jumping off point to start thinking about sharing more broadly and more holistically as part of an overall city strategy. I actually have one concrete example that doesn't come from Airbnb. In San Francisco, um, the sharing economy companies have joined together in an organization called BayShare, and we share a lot of the experiences and help each other out with policymakers. And the car sharing companies have faced a, an interesting challenge recently. The city of San Francisco's Metropolitan Transportation Agency provides um, city-owned parking spaces to car sharing organizations like Zipcar and City Car Share and has for many years. And as a requirement to get access to those special uh, parking spaces, those organizations are required to demonstrate their environmental impacts and how they're saving the city from extra cars on the street and all this jazz. And um, Recently, the new car sharing companies have asked for access to those spaces and the city has said no, because right now they don't have any proof of their environmental impacts and those companies are really frustrated. Of course we have amazing impacts, far better than Zipcar and City Car Share, why won't you let us get access to those parking spaces? And the city said, we are giving you a subsidy if we give you a subsidy and it all of a sudden turns out that you don't have the impacts that you say you have, we get in big trouble. And so there's kind of a chicken and an egg problem here where the companies are still too small um, to demonstrate amazing impacts on the city and having access to these parking spaces would greatly help them grow. But at the same time, the city can't do that for them unless they demonstrate their positive impacts. So it's a great example of where you really need to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Uh, just to, to add something on, uh, on, on your remark, um, I think that m maybe a, a solution, uh, because when you say impact, it's like when you say business plan. In advance, it's very hard to be sure about what your business plan is and what your impact will be. So why don't we try to uh, be open and propose ex to experiment, which is much easier on a local base than on a huge uh, national or international base. So for in cities, and it's exactly what you say, taking into account the exact local situation, uh, the, the needs of uh, citizens, we can suggest to experiment and see and adapt with feedbacks. I mean, uh, it would be uh, the, the lean city, like we have uh, lean startups. <laughs> and, and in order to do that, you recommend um, share economy companies to join forces and be all together. So should, should there be a national sharing economy lobby in every country in the world? No. Or do we need more social movements? What do you think? Uh, l lobby, I, I just don't like that word because all the... Because, old you're, because you're French, maybe. No, no <laughs> maybe, yes, maybe. But all the, okay, let's talk about France. All the, the public policies are made by lobby uh, here, which are... Uh, uh, but we, we don't call them lobbies in France. It's not only in France. Huh? Uh, and those lobbies are uh, just group of economic interest 
wanted to make sure that uh, their business will develop in a friendly uh, legal uh, environment. So if we want to change things in this sharing economy, I think we also need to change the way uh, policies are made. And why not, within this sector, yes, work together, but be open uh, on what are impacts. Don't, don't um, be so sure that what you're doing is good <laughs> in terms of good or bad. I mean, it's, uh, we need to question ourselves and work or, with or others. Or maybe it's good on an economic level, but not so good on an environmental exactly. level. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a global question. So mm. if, if, we, if we approach it in a really open way and work with, with policymakers, but also work with citizens and accept that uh, to question our, our models, uh, I think we can really have a, a great impact if we just create lobby and group of pressure, we don't change anything. Again, the French perspective and the American perspective, maybe? I don't know that it's French versus American. Um, but what I would like to say is I'm not sure that lobby is the right term here. I do believe there is an enormous opportunity for what I will term more a consortium. It's not political per se, but there is an enormous amount, to Molly's point about Bay Share, so much that we can do and learn together and the space is still so nascent, as Helen said, embryonic in some ways, that there are certain, it's not about making things political or even necessarily setting a policy, but what we can learn from one another, what companies can learn from one another, what countries can learn from one another, um, and this is, this is not intended as a plug for Collaborative Lab, but I will note that we um, have a global network of curators, people in 20 different countries from the United States and France to Brazil and Israel and Kenya, who basically help us identify and curate content happening in these local markets. And that curator network is such an asset simply from a learning perspective and what we term like the connective tissue. Sometimes that might turn into something that's related to policy in terms of a lobbying effort. Other times it might simply be about how do we attract more people to this space. Other times it might be about how do we tackle a particular problem in a given city. So I think there is a huge need for that, but it's not um, necessarily a political Exactly. And, and actually, initiative. yeah, there, there is already, so uh, Molly mentioned Bay Share in San Francisco. There is already uh, uh, Share Netherlands in, in, in Netherlands. And I know that there is a, a working group also in, in, in France. So an association might be uh, launched very soon. Molly, you want to Sure. Share? I'd like to add some very concrete examples. First of all, I think it, April is right. It's really phenomenal to have a global and hyper-local network of sharing enthusiasts. But in my own experience, um, those networks are not particularly useful when um, talking with policymakers. They provide great support and um, a great community and a great constituency to demonstrate to the policymakers. But you really do need people who understand the regulatory issues and can talk with policymakers in specific terms that um, in a language that they understand. And so we found it very useful, for example, in San Francisco, I believe we started the very first ever sharing economy coalition, and it was not to lobby. It was actually in response to the mayor of San Francisco who created a sharing economy working group of various city officials to tackle various sharing policies. And he asked us, the sharing economy community, which was not organized at the time, what should I tackle first? What are the biggest issues? Please make me recommendations. So we organized BayShare. You can look it up, bayshare.org. We organized BayShare for the sole purpose of convening the policy brains at all of these organizations to come together and make recommendations to the city of San Francisco. Not just that, but also to do partnerships and all kinds of things. We're working on disaster relief uh, planning with the city. So I absolutely think there is a need for hyper-local hyper organizations of the policy brains in this world who can work with the policymakers on the ground. 
I also think there is a need for a global movement of the communities of sharers. This is not an industry association of the companies, but rather a global movement of the people who participate in these activities. And Airbnb is in the process of working with many other stakeholders right now to create that. So if you're at all interested in learning about how to form a Bayshare-like coalition in your city, and on our website we're providing tools for that on bayshare.org, or if you're interested in learning about the global sharing movement, come see me at that table over there sometime today. How, how are we going to do that? How are we going to build a, a social global movement of sharers? It ain't easy, but I'll talk to you about it in specifics if you come see me at the table. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, did you want to add something, Helen? Yeah, I wanted to add that um, I, I agree that kind of um, the idea of lobbying is perhaps a little bit 20th century in some ways, and um, the idea of having a coalition of the willing or people who can support each other and learn from each other is really important. Um, the way in which that kind of intersects with uh, government um, policymakers and practitioners, um, I've been thinking, well, we're doing lots of experimentation actually with how we can adopt open innovation methodologies to make that work. So open innovation practiced a lot in the corporate sector where you've moved away from kind of closed protectionist strategies to innovate new ideas and actually looking beyond your organizational boundaries to kind of um, ser service and source new products and services. You know, governments in the UK are looking to this now to say, hey, well, how can we experiment with something that's embryonic that we think intuitively and we have some early stage impact that it might be good, but we yet can't make a kind of firm policy about it. What are the processes for us for experimenting? And that's about sharing the risks and sharing the rewards with the people that you're partnering with. And thankfully now there's enough kind of um, uh, evidence or data out there to show that these sorts of methods can work really, really well in taking you to the step towards having firm policies and frameworks that work in a more mature economy. And Laura, you wanted to add something? Just, just a word um, oh, regarding policy making. Maybe one first step is to, as I said uh, previously, uh, share existing solutions, how we make it happen within the existing context, which is also what we are doing in ShareLex. We have a, a group in France and in Spain already uh, started with both entrepreneurs and lawyers of the sharing economies, sharing uh, practical solutions on the way they do on a day-to-day -day basis within the existing framework. So same as uh, Molly, if you want to start one in your own country, just come and uh, talk with me. And if you want to start Wisha in your own country, you can come also to talk to me. <laughs> and if you want to be a curator in our network, any, you can come and talk to me. Any other advertisement? <laughs> uh, so we have like, f well, 10 minutes left. Are there any questions in the audience? Yeah, there's one question. Maybe if, you, yeah. Where was the question, sorry? Uh, thank you for your stories. Um, my name is Itika, I'm from Peerby, and that's a website that enables you to borrow stuff from people nearby. Um, and in my work, I also work with municipalities, governmental institutions, and they're quite scared to work with a social, though social, enterprise. They don't really want to uh, partner, actually. Um, and I know that, for example, in the UK, you have special taxes for uh, social enterprises. In Germany you have, I think, a legal body, which is different from the others for social enterprises. Um, Seul, Seul, Seul? <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. Sounds great, but are there more examples in, um, in Europe where governmental institutions are really open to uh, social initiatives, sharing initiatives? Sure, uh, I mean, just from Airbnb's experience, um, pretty much there is someone within every city who is open and interested in the sharing economy. You have to find that right person. In our experience, cities that have been particularly receptive in Europe include um, Hamburg in Germany. Um, we've actually found that Amsterdam has been uh, pretty, surprisingly pretty open. Um, London, thanks to a lot of the work that Nesta is doing. 
um, has been pretty open. Any others from over there at the table? I think that's it. Uh, just to your, to your point, I think, uh, you know, I think local governments do find it hard sometimes to partner with SMEs or social enterprises, and I don't necessarily think that's about kind of the type of entity it is. I think there's a general kind of um, nervousness about working with early stage organisations that might not be around next year. Um, or that haven't quite proven um, to the extent that they might want you to prove your case, I think. And um, that will change as time goes on. And the ways in which um, similar kinds of platforms and enterprises choose to bring themselves together in terms of how they can partner or work with or be commissioned by um, the public sector is probably um, something that happens to needs to happen a little bit more, I think. I actually um, have one yes, more can tip. I, can I just... Uh, answer or add something to this because they almost literally said if you were a foundation then we would help you but as you are a company and oh, you mean for profit yeah right for profit okay. yeah no that's that's a bit, that's a problem I mean we fund for, for profit um, innovations with public money and we come under an enormous amount of scrutiny for doing so um, but uh, my the way that we frame the argument is that those people in the third sector and in the voluntary sector and community sectors are having to develop kind of self-sustaining. They're having to be more for-profit and more commercial-like if they want to sustain themselves. And I think by virtue of that, one can't then um, uh, uh, kind of d take away from the fact that some people are in it to be profitable because actually that's how you kind of um, wash your own face and survive. What, one last tip. The... the people that tend to be the most receptive to our kinds of business models and want to help us are the people are the investment agencies so every city region country has invest in x and their job is to basically attract more tech entrepreneurs to move there or, or, or start businesses there. And rather than talking about all of the positive impacts that you have on your community at Peerby, those people are gonna be more interested in you talking about your enterprise growing and you uh, generating jobs. And they're gonna be very eager to help you if you do that. So I encourage you to look into the investment agencies that exist all over the world. And one final point, um, it's more of a technical response, but um, I'm also trained as a lawyer and I've spent lots of time looking at the legal and regulatory structures of lots of different countries. And there's a very practical sort of baseline assessment you probably want to do. And this is where we can say, hey, look at these other cities. But at the end of the day, it's really about how the Dutch system is structured, which is very different than the French, certainly different than the United States and even individual states within. So sometimes they have obligations um, for example, really a lot of it relates to tax deductibility and things like that, that they simply can't look beyond that particular mandate. But then other times you do have, as, as Helen mentioned, more flexibility, that, that membrane is permeable and you can look at investing in for-profit and non-profit. So before you get really concerned or um, start thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Take a look at what is like permissible and then find that set of investors, and sometimes they're in the public sector and sometimes they're in the private sector, but where they actually have a much broader mandate and ability and flexibility to make different kinds of investments, both of charitable dollars, but maybe also of um, investment dollars as well. We have, we have another question here. Hello, thanks. So uh, I, I don't quite agree with what you said, Anne uh, that laws are only made by lobbies, 100%. I think there are two main sources of uh, having a voice in democracy. Let's say either you represent jobs or you represent ballots, votes. So in the first case, you're a lobby. In the second, you're a, a political party, let's say. So my question is, do you think there is a, an opportunity for political parties to take this enthusiasm that we see today uh, and in so many other occasions, to um, propose a, a sharing society and build a political uh, program around that? Thanks. I, I can take a that a little bit. Um, so I think this whole notion of a shareable city, and there's a panel this afternoon on this as well. So there is definitely um, an opportunity for a political party or an individual candidate to make this part of his or her platform. You could easily imagine this becoming part of why somebody is running and why you should elect them and all the rest. And um, if that helps further the agenda, I think it's, you know, I'm all for that, if you will. 
I think where the more important question comes is it's one thing to proclaim, yes, we're going to, to do this and, and this is going to get me elected. Once that person is in office, what is the plan, what is the strategy, what is the roadmap, and what is the, the commitment at every level of the government um, that will actually carry that through? So I suppose it's more about what are your actions and, and do, how do they match with your words. But I do think there is the potential for lots of parties and individuals to make this part of their campaign, but then they need to be able to follow through. And that's where I think there's a lot of interest amongst many cities to take that kind of action, but very relatively few have developed an integrated holistic roadmap for practical action. I, I'd just say, um, I would encourage the sharing economy to stay nonpartisan. I think um, we're uniquely positioned to appeal to the entire political spectrum, and it will behoove us to stay neutral. Um, I would also say that, yes, there is definitely a compelling um, reason for the sharing economy to get involved with political parties, and I hope that one day all of the political parties will talk about shareable cities as um, on their platform. Um, and I think the most important thing is for the sharing community to demonstrate what kind of a constituency they are. So when you go and talk with policymakers, they say, well, who do you represent? How many are you? Are you my voters? Are you in my district? What demographics do you represent? So we need to demonstrate that better when we're engaging with policymakers, and that's something we hope to do with this movement that I mentioned before. I agree with you, and I, I uh, just wanted to add that we, I think we need to work with everybody, but really stay away from ideology. Uh. That, that will be the conclusion. Uh, thank you so much. If you have uh, other questions, please uh, come and talk directly to the, uh, to the speakers. Thank you.